The Broken Brain is sponsored by Give a Derm excellent and 100% natural skincare products. Go to www.giveaderm.com. Make sure to use the code BROKENBRAIN at checkout for a 10% discount. The Broken Brain. Yeah, no, I'm I'm recording locally. This is Audacity. It should it should have told you if it ever was going to do that, which it would not. <laughs> recording in progress. Okay. No, it's a my business like situation. Okay. Brendan's doing that surreptitious recording on Audacity. Oh, oh, mm-hmm. It's a good thing that yeah. we understood it was going to happen. It's, and then it's, talking it's over room tone like he always does. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everybody, back to another fine episode of The Broken Brain. This is uh, me, Dwight, your host and therapist in the room for this session of uh, wonderfulness and uh, great additions to joy in your life. That's a tall order, but I think we're up to it. I am uh, really, really grateful to be joined. Uh, first of all, Dr. London Smith of the Jock Doc podcast is my co-host for today. Uh, hi, London. How are you? Hello. Good to be here. Good good to have you. Hailing from the mm-hmm. beautiful state of Texas. You're back from your European whirlwind tour. Yeah, my voyage. Yes. Yeah. Uh, mostly not by sea, but you know. <laughs> but you're back. So you flew. You flew I, I, yeah. Boy, are yeah, your just, <laughs> arms tired. Anyway. Yeah. Realize the <laughs> amount of implication in the word voyage. <laughs> Never. Okay. Well, that one. Whew. Okay, I took myself on one just now. Okay. Okay. Well, We're good. You, you're back now here in this room. Is more or less okay all right yes <laughs> and uh we're we're so happy to welcome uh the, the guest who i've been super excited to talk to uh, as we've been going back and forth to set the times and we finally we finally got it and uh welcome to the show paul morrissey hey thank you guys so much for having me yeah it's been a uh mine has mostly been an air but it was uh i think i was in new hampshire florida Mexico, Toronto, uh, and I'm actually in Toronto right now, uh, and I'm doing a Canadian tour. So I do Toronto, Ottawa, and Montreal the next uh, two and a half weeks. So I'm just starting now. So you got me fresh. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Paul, of course, is a uh, is professional uh, comedian, and I'm going to let you give everybody some of your own uh, background, but you've been doing lots of things for a long time. I was watching uh, some of your appearances on the, the Tonight Show and how you've done, uh, you know, uh, a different uh, different things in different places that people will have heard of. So, I mean, you can tell people a little bit about uh, who you are and where you're coming from. Oh, thanks so much. Well, actually, Letterman was my that was my uh, my <laughs> dream. Said. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, a Tonight Show, I think, right? Or did you? I not? said Tonight Wait, Show, we, but there's so many of them that I, I use that as an we umbrella can, without. Yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I well, I, you know, growing up, uh, my my the, the whole reason I took this weird route was because I loved David Letterman, and I knew that he started as a weatherman in Indiana, Indianapolis, uh, and he actually got fired because he said there's going to be hail the size of canned hams in Muncie, Indiana. That's <laughs> what he actually got fired for. <laughs> and so because they weren't uh, that big or what I, I that's or just yeah, it was too yeah just the dimensions yeah. were just so goofing hard. around, you know, dr- just uh you know like you can't you couldn't do that as a weather guy. That's yeah, like uh I, I you know expected, they peaked, uh, something much more blue. People taking that too seriously. Well it's it's just the, the um you know and I'm from upstate New York which is kind of very uh, you know, I would say serious, but dry kind of place, you know, like as far as being a comedian goes, that's like saying you wanted to be a wizard or something, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, okay, you can play around and do that, but you have to have a real job. Like you can be a, you can tell jokes, but you got to be the mailman and deliver mail. You know, mm-hmm. that's not like the one thing that you can do. And so, um, yeah, I just grew up in a small town and, and, uh, you know, I played basketball. My dad was a gym teacher. I ended up playing college basketball and then got into sports broadcasting through that. And then through the sports broadcasting, that got me in front of a camera. I was never a performer, never comfortable speaking in front of people. The The sports actually got me in front of the biggest crowds I'd ever been in front of. 
And so, uh, so that, that's what's interesting about, you know, the psychology. I know you had a lot of sports people on too. And so, um, you know, just, uh, I'm only five, nine, so I played college basketball. So I was pretty much against the odds there. And then, you know, in com, you know, actually, to be honest with you, in sports broadcasting, that's probably the, the least odds that you ever have because there's only 200 markets in the whole country. There's two sports guys. So you're looking at less than a thousand people doing this job. Mm. And so I think that's even more rare than comedy and more. I think it's like less than 1% of high school players playing college. So, so a lot of these, you know, fields that I'm picking are very, very slim to none odds. So um, either I'm really stupid or uh, I kind of believe in myself or at least <laughs> I don't mind failing. You know, I think that's one of the things too, that you can talk about on the, the, the mental side is that you don't have to be afraid to fail, especially, you know, in, in, in sports like baseball, where you're failing 70% of the time, if you're a a hall of famer, you know, or, you know, in comedy, when you're trying, you know, maybe one out of 10 jokes is going to stay in your act. Mm -hmm. So, um, even if you're amazing. So it's, it's a, you know, I think the mental part of, of doing a lot of these careers is what keeps people from, you know, I'll just do, cause I did the same thing too. Even when I started doing comedy and my backup plan was, I was going to be a teacher. I got my master's in education. And so I think everyone plans for like a safe thing. Cause mentally it feels like that's the secure place when in, in, in reality, that's the worst place you want to be because you're not doing what you really want to be doing. So I would rather have a doctor or a teacher who really loves doing that than than somebody who's doing it as a fallback plan and want to be an artist or something, you know. So, um, so yeah. But, but, so basically, I got into comedy through through those kind of things, and I was I was very funny on the news, like like uh, you know SNL Weekend Update. I would say. I, I'm very influenced by Norm Macdonald and and uh, and Letterman, those kind of broadcasters. And so I started goofing around and I went to a comedy club in Sacramento, which is the area I was doing. And one of the women who was working there was like, you're really funny on the news. You should do stand up. And then that's how I kind of got into stand up. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have ever thought about trying it, but it just kind of did fall in my lap. And when when somebody you know, when it's a thing that you think you want to try and somebody gives you the opportunity, I think you always go after it. But I, I don't think I would have jumped after it myself, you know. Now, there's probably a little more leeway uh, for humor in sports broadcasting than obviously than in weathermanning, as it turns out. Yeah, I think so, too. And and to be honest, like I did take sports very seriously and I love basketball, which was the funny part, because everyone that I was working with, was like, we can tell you like basketball because whenever you're doing, you know, like I remember the owner of the station used to have me do like racquetball highlights of his friends at like some YMCA. And I just like, I was just like showing the guys drinking beer in between the games. I was <laughs> making fun of the whole yeah. thing because I just thought it was stupid. And it's like, oh, okay. You can kind of tell. I mean, that's one thing too is like you can kind of tell when somebody's interested in something and when they're not, you know, mm, yeah. even, even with yourself, I, I'm not a good fake it till you make it kind of person. Like you can tell when I'm not having a good time. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, that's one of the reasons that I take issue with a lot of affirmations, to be honest. Uh, that's one in particular that I think is very difficult. Fake it till you make it. I mean, on the one isolated definition of trying to communicate confidence, I think, yeah, sure, I guess, but still a a deeper understanding. But when it comes to being like, yeah, fake it, do what you hate until you love it, it's like, well, that seems like a weird plan and uh, doesn't always pan out, as it turns out, to anything to where, yeah, if if you're going to be a thing, you want to be the thing. I I was curious, too, you're talking about uh, really loving basketball, and I it seems to me that's probably easier to generate humor about things that you are passionate about, right? I mean, passionate can go, I guess, both ways, love or hate, but something you care a lot about. Yeah, I mean, well, the strange part about that is that when you when you really love something, so obviously I love playing, 
and then the there were options to play after college and then it was like do i want to coach basketball or do i want to like go into the sports thing and i did an internship and that's what kind of showed me like oh this would be fun too and also you know i was to be honest with you i was a very creative kid from about you know my my brother's a surgeon he's a cancer surgeon my he's a genius my sister's really smart I was the one that was like a little bit like uh, kind of staring at the clouds a little bit. And it was like third grade, I guess they had some kind of like IQ or uh, some weird kind of like creative test. And I got put in this like, um, uh, I I don't know what they would call like gifted something, you know, like, hey, his grades aren't that great, but he seems to be creative. So, you know, we we got to go to museums and see a lot of stuff. And so. I started writing plays and I, my handwriting was so bad that my teacher would type up these plays and they were just little like, you know, labyrinth, meet a monster kind of stuff. But we would act them out in like third and fourth grade. And, uh, you know, I was doing pastel drawings that I couldn't even do now, I don't think. So I was very creative, like before sports. And then when basketball kind of came in, that was all I did. And so from you know, from that period until after I finished playing college, even my last semester, my independent study was a creative writing thing. And I wrote 10 short stories and I had never written anything from, from like fifth grade until my senior year of college. So, um, I knew there was like a creative part there. And I think if I stayed just with sports and basketball, I was never gonna, never, Never gonna you know creatively sometimes basketball you know dribbling and moving so that it's it is a great uh for your imagination and you can come up with different things but i just feel like with stories and character and dialogue it was something that that was waiting to get out of me well, i love hearing by the way about if that uh, may- absolutely but i mean it, it sounds sounds like they really tried to meet the needs of the students that they had instead of forcing you into a, a box. At least that's what it sounds like if I'm interpreting your school experience correctly, um, which is not always the case. I know a lot of people that get into more into the arts almost uh, because they weren't. They're, I mean, and some people who avoid the arts, I guess, always because they weren't nurtured at all about creativity. So that, I mean, that, that's interesting. It sounds like that was an important experience for you. Yeah, I mean, my mom was a, you know, she's a retired nurse and she was like an artist. She could draw, you know, Mickey Mouse and all these cartoons and stuff. And it was just something she did for fun. It was never like a pursuit. Even now she's, you know, I do uh, jokes. One of the things I was mentioning, I I have an album that just came out. It's called Ice Cream Versus Everything, which kind of sets the tone of my comedy, Uh, you know, because it's very... um, you know, a lot of my stuff is very silly and observational. I talk a lot about food and, and, uh, you know, I, my, my kind of approach to comedy is like letting people escape for an hour instead of like, let's work through all the problems we all have, which I know is, you know, there's, there's a validity to both of those approaches, but, um, but when I, whenever I would see comedy, I kind of like the the escapism of it or the the silliness of it, you know, which sometimes doesn't get as much credit as you know. Even the Academy Award, the comedy movies never win anything, you know. It's got to be a serious or something that's supposed to change your life, and and I think comedy's changed my life more than anything. So, yeah, I definitely uh. I feel the same way. Uh, I know whenever I go to, I've been writing stand up for like roughly a year ish. And before I started writing, I would go to the local open mics in Dallas. And one of the things that I observed right away, for one thing, it's very sad. People are throwing themselves at it generally, whether they know how to write or not. But um, so often it is people just trying to be dark and gritty from the very start. And, uh, Whereas I, I lean more towards the, uh, what, what I think of as like improv brain, the more the silly stuff, and then you try to refine it into proper stand up. Uh, that whole, I don't know. There's a concept of, yeah, people trying to confront societal issues or become very sexual in their approach with with the jokes. But 
uh i've i've liked your comedy and that yeah you like uh before we started this uh you mentioned oh, Gaffigan, thanks. like similar and uh like i'm told it's more challenging but it's certainly what i gravitate towards as well the, keeping it a little cleaner but still like it's obviously very relatable because it's what we all experience and like you said escapism yeah there's there's a funny thing even even in uh there was one i think it was an improv class or it, it was actually i did like a a solo show it was actually based on when i was talking about the um sports earlier uh mm-hmm. part of my job at the tv station i had to cover news two days a week and okay. i was wow. i was terrible at that mm-hmm. and basically like you had to be your own producer and come up with like four stories a week and i was oh, in like yeah. i was at this bureau in chico california which is in the middle of nowhere and it's like do you want me to cause a car accident like nothing <laughs> is gonna happen here and so <laughs> So I basically just started doing like daily show kind of stories at a real station, just going to the mall and doing man on the street stuff and making fun of people. And, you know, I think I think a lot of, you know, I got promoted to sports anchor just because they didn't want me doing those (laughs) news stories anymore, to be honest with you, because I was getting people. I, I remember we had the guy from the movie Airplane, Robert Hayes. Oh, yeah. which I love that movie. Mm-hmm. And I think I still, I've never had fish because of that movie because I watched that <laughs> when I was a little kid and everyone got sick from the fish on the plane. But uh, uh, but he had like a recycling business. It was supposed to be just a regular news story. And I'm just like doing, you know, lines from airplane. We're using clips from the movie, which is like <laughs> completely illegal. Yeah. Uh, and they're, you know, everyone else is doing this thing about saving the plant and recycling, and I'm just doing like you know, showing stuff. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. So don't yeah. call me surely. <laughs> did the guy? And how the, did he react? Oh, he he's hilarious. Okay. So he had yeah. a blast. I you know, and I would say like, is this the biggest uh, project you've ever undertaken? He's like, oh yeah. There's clips from Godzilla. There's the other thing. You know, he was very dry and funny about it too. Yeah. So. <laughs> awesome yeah but my uh but my uh news director was not very happy about that Excuse <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah that was just one of the early signs of maybe this isn't for you <laughs> yeah, it it hit me as you're talking about the just basically the silliness and connecting with the escapism that some of those things uh at the same time that you might characterize it as silliness Um, I would say from listening to you talk about it, you don't feel silly about it. In other words, there's an importance to that, I think, right? An importance to being able for people uh, to check in. And it's not always about the, you know, some big ground shaking here to challenge your worldview kind of thing. And not that there's not a play. I'm not saying that's not important, but, but it sounds like there's a feeling of importance about silliness. uh, Well, especially nowadays. Yeah, I think um, I think it came in later on because I think initially comedy is very selfish pursuit. It's you kind of want to show that you can do this and I'm funny and there's no there's no <clears throat> feeling that, that you're going to make it in the beginning. It's just I think you're kind of doing it because you like doing it and you feel like I don't know if that's, uh, you know, how he feels, but, uh, you know, that most people just end up doing comedy, especially if, you know, if it, they're not ultimately like, you know, cause we were just talking about how, you know, there's kids now they're in improv classes and, you know, middle school and all this kind of stuff. And we never had any of those outlets. So I know kids that are like, boy, like, ah, oh, I got an improv class. today. It's like, are you kidding me? You're complaining about that? Like, you know, so, uh, so for me, uh, you know, the, the escapism part was to lighten the mood. So, Mm -hmm. you know, my mom being an oncology nurse and my brother doing cancer surgery, that's a pretty heavy side of the family. And so like to cheer my mom up even, or, you know, she's a very happy person for that book. She's perfect for what she did. And she's changed people's lives as well. And, uh, but, but, to me, to me, I remember she worked like in an old folks home and we'd go visit people. And then the next time we come by, they weren't there. So I thought people went to the hospital to die, you know? So that's what I was like, 
you know, so that freaked me out. So I was yeah. so scared of anything medical wise for a long time. And then um, it was during like the last, I would say about 10 years ago, I started doing, there was these cancer support uh, community uh, shows. And it was for people going through treatments and just uh, helping helping them like, you know, it's just like a, a community center to help help cancer patients. And they did shows on Monday night at five o'clock, which just looking at from the outside, you're like, oh, this is the worst gig of all time. You know, like people with cancer at Monday at five at not even a real comedy club, just a room. And I got to tell you, it changed my life. I'm not even underestimating this. It's, you know, there's 40, 50 people there. They were amazing. I didn't think about like, you know, what jokes I'm working on or what I'm going to, you know, I was just like, what is going to make these people happy? You know, like I'm cheering these people up and this changed me because it's helping them. And so that was like a real groundbreaker for me because um you know at that point it was very kind of a selfish thing and this is the thing where it's like oh i am actually helping people because my mom always said that too she's like you know cheering people up that you know cause especially state of mind when you're going through illness or you're going through you know any kind of like depression or something you know people tell you that oh i really needed that today or when they come to your show they're like, oh i really needed a laugh it's been a rough week and i always kind of blew that off a little bit but it, it was when those shows kind of happened um and then i got kind of sick of doing these you know i would do new year's eve at some club and everybody would be so drunk and then i would actually i did there's one year i did a new year's eve at a rehab in portland oregon for like you know 150 people that were either just starting rehab or had been in it for a month and and it was in a church and you're just like, how is this going to work? And it was again, same experience, amazing and life changing for me. And while I'm really helping these people. And so, um, so those all kind of meant more to me than any of those comedy club shows where I'm working on this new joke that I love, which, you know, that's, I love the creative process, but there are moments where you can see like, oh, this is, this is leading me towards something. So, you know, from those uh, kind of initial shows, I started going like, well, maybe I can go to, I have the opportunity to go to Switzerland and Asia and a bunch of different places. And so uh, that also meant the same to me because I was like, oh, I can make somebody in Vietnam laugh at this mattress joke that I made in <laughs> my basement, you know, in upstate New York. And so that uh, made it feel a little bit bigger at some point. And I know that sounds like a loftier thing, but um, but it really did make a difference. And and uh, you know, so to to you know, the long way of answering your question is, yeah, it it definitely. I think um, you know, it's 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 you know, I used to take that very lightly when people would be like, oh you really helped me today or that I needed that laugh. I, and I, I can tell when they mean it now, you know? Well, I find that uh, when I've known people and worked with people who have uh, chronic pain conditions or if they have, uh, uh, you know, terminal uh, conditions or if they're going through uh, it, get entering sobriety, just some really serious times in their life, one of the things that's the hardest is feeling like people treat me as a normal person, right? And what's more normal than jokes and laughter? I mean, everybody wants to laugh, and everybody likes to be funny and be around funny moments and funny people, right? Um, and so I think that I, – I also think that nowadays – and I'd be interested to see what both you guys think of this. I, I feel like even just in the media and the entertainment that we consume, we've gotten so – into the darkened, like like uh, cynical kind of thing where Superman's evil and he's going to kill you and whatever, and whatever. Not not to down that, I, whatever. But I think that we've gotten such a glut of that that there's a lot of value that people have in, uh, let's say, sincerity. You know, you could say wholesomeness. Mm -hmm. I know that has all kinds of different subjective meanings, but I just mostly I think of it as sincerity of like it's what's and to me being silly 
you're really being vulnerable because it's like, hey, I'm just being up here playing. I'm being up here and being silly. Hard work to actually make it funny and, and all that. Um, but it's even more vulnerable, I think, in a way. So anyway, just that sincerity, I think, is is something people value nowadays. I don't know. I'm interested to see what you guys think about that. I know. Um... Yeah, I'll, I'll let him talk because I've been talking too much. So, yeah, <laughs> let me know what you think. <laughs> uh, well, I, I mean, just to contrast a little bit from stand up versus improv in terms of uh, once get that's I sort of these are two separate areas of my brain that I lean sort of one way or another and use one to build the other sometimes. So the way I divide it is, uh, yeah, improv has the vulnerability of um, you go up there and you don't necessarily have anything, uh, especially if you're doing stand up. then that's a lot of times that's the crowd work aspect. You ask a question, you don't know what the audience is going to say. And then uh, that whenever I think of the sort of the art of stand up, it's, they'll say something and you try to make a human connection in that moment. And that is the ultimate vulnerability and sincerity. I, w- I would think to that. Um, but in terms of, uh, yeah, because uh, w- with the question of being, I don't know, life being so heavy and serious just by default, we all, we will all struggle with the concept of mortality. <laughs> Uh, all these heavy concepts exist. And what I notice is that they don't have to exist all the time when you're for leisure. Uh, I had friends who would always be like, Oh, you want to like, why don't we talk about the serious stuff so much? And often I'm like, I'm going to have to, you know, especially I was working clinically at the time I was doing practicing medicine and they'd be like, why don't you want to talk about this? Well, it's already there. That's the default thing. You already have to deal with that no matter what. Other people don't get to be silly. People don't get to especially uh, get paid to be silly or to to have sort of a structural platform to be yeah. on. And there are people who appreciate it. Like he said, there are people who are deeply affected by it. I mean, I for one in med school, uh, other students and myself, after a long day of studying, of tests, of whatever, being confronted with existential issues, uh, we aren't going to turn on more, you know, dark humor stuff. Usually we're going to usually watch something light. And to me, that's, once again, that's relief that, that helps us to, uh, keep on going. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, and for me, you know, when I've had, uh, you know, whether it's relationships or different, you know, when I've, uh, you know, spoken to a therapist, it's, that's been my outlet for that kind of stuff. Cause I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but I can feel when I'm, you know, when you're laying, like, like you're saying about, Oh, let's talk about this serious thing. And I'm like, I feel like I'm laying this on uh, another person, which is mm-hmm. probably my own issue, but it's like, you know, I'd rather, you know, do that in therapy and get it out of the way. Yeah, and then I can kind of be myself, and that, I feel like I kind of use therapy as that kind of tool more than the the outlet of it. Because for comedy, I guess I mean I will say this though: I've always had a, a problem with insomnia. It's kind of in my family, and I don't know medically where you guys are at that point. You know, I've studied it. There's like master's classes, and there's you know belief that like. You know, there's people that sleep from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. There's people that sleep from 1 a.m. to 8 a.m. There's it's like in your genetic, uh, you know, I've, I've read all kinds of stuff. But it's just the fact that me and my mom are both insomniacs. And my I think my my dad and my brother are on the other way. But I've always kind of fought against it. And then, you know, even in society, like, oh, you got to get to sleep. You can't stay up late. You know, it's and and it puts this pressure on you. And um, and I just I think about 10 years ago, just embrace that part of it. And it's like, if I'm going to be up until one o'clock, I'm going to watch the best 100 movies of all time. I'm going to watch, mm-hmm. you know, The Hustler and, you know, all these movies that I never saw. Or I'm going to write this script that I've been working on or. I'm going to lean into it and then, or read something. And so that, you know, from 11 to one is like my most productive time. And I've read a lot of, uh, there's a book called, um, I don't, I don't think it's an artist way. It's, um, it's basically, oh man, I'm blanking on it, 
but it's Mason Curie is the author and it's basically every artist and what their creative process was. So like, Mm. you know, Van Gogh, did he get up and drink coffee for an hour? Did he work for two hours? I mean, it's really laid out to like the craziest stuff, you know, like, uh, Lautrec, the, the, the short, uh, artist, the guy who did all the, um, the, uh, the posters for, for Moulin Rouge, Mm. he would just hang out at bars all night and drink absinthe and work in the morning. And so they, they lay out like every crazy artist schedule. And uh, I've read books like that, but um, I'm interested to see what you guys think of like insomnia or that creative process. Insomnia. I mean, from the medical side of it, I know uh, like it, there is just the actual diagnosis. I know there are medications to treat it, but I also know that I, I most likely self-diagnosed uh so i never trust my own self-diagnosis but uh, they tell you to do I'd that say, in medical school right they have a whole course on how you should self-diagnose yeah right, I think. yeah they're like <laughs> hey you you're you're all in your 20s you're all excited to uh be scared of whatever you're reading about so uh, go ahead and diagnose yourself with everything and, that's a great habit and you know the least now that you will over the next few years right so good timing yeah, yeah. go ahead yeah so uh delayed circadian rhythm disorder is something i probably have uh instead of whatever getting tired at 10 or midnight i'm always 2 3 a.m uh and i like even working a regular schedule i I always felt like i was playing catch up on the weekends so uh that i understand um anxiety i also definitely uh deal with that and as you said it's it's a thing where i try to you know i'm staying up later i have this anxiety can i channel it into something constructively um and yeah, I, I think your your instinct is sort of, especially if you can find a balance with it, uh, then that is a fair way to do it. If you can get your life to structurally work with it, then yeah, it's uh, t- turn your weaknesses into strengths. Um, I also know that you know a great many famous comedians, right, creative people will uh, brag on their medications. <laughs> so it's not, yeah. that's also not a weakness at all. The, these days, fortunately, it's been very normalized. The stigmas, uh, maybe not entirely gone, but a lot lifted. So mm-hmm. they'll all, yeah, give just straight up, give shout outs to their medications sometimes on stage, which I think is, uh, is great. It's, you know, <laughs> no worries there. Well, that openness too. I, I That's one of the things I think is helpful. I, I, I kind of, half prescribe half you know whatever uh Mm -hmm. comedy as an intervention for a lot of the people i work with especially those that do talk about you know mental health and those things um and also those i mean to be honest that's one of the things i like about just and and about the style that that you have paul which is just write you write jokes and nowadays there's a lot of stories and things that people tell which are very good and once again even some of that dark confrontational stuff but if you don't actually have a joke in there it's just not as funny there's <laughs> seems rudimentary to someone like me i'm outside the industry though but um you know actually having that i was curious about you mentioned the a lot of of things that have come up are the social expectations and i wonder sometimes when i even with insomnia and other things how much of those things are about when we think we're supposed to sleep or what we think we're supposed to do for a living. Mm-hmm. And I know both you had talked about it, Paul, and I know, Linda, when you were on the show before, you've talked about having to have a backup. And both of you, it's interesting, both of you pursued quite a specialized backup too, master's education, medical doctorate, like things that yeah. require like, I'm in, this is a whole thing that I'm doing. But anyway, so I guess, you know, I, I do wonder about that, of what what role does it play when am I supposed to sleep? How am I supposed to think about things? What job am I allowed to have that's non arts based or whatever? Yeah, well, I think that even even uh, you know that's that's how you knew. Like I had this you know on air TV job, whereas having a blast, I was covering you know at the NBA and NFL stuff, and I and uh, and I'm still like at night, I'm writing jokes for this, you know, open mic I'm doing once a week, or I'm, I'm sneaking out to do this show at a bar in between the six and 11 o'clock news. Like, that's how you knew, like, I definitely, my, I'm more passionate about this even now. And this is a job I love. So then I know I really like doing this other thing. And it did, 
lead me to the next thing. That's another, you know, when kids talk to me about like, how do you know you want to be a comedian? I was like, I just think you just need to find things that you like doing. Cause it is really hard enough to find a couple of your interests. And if you can find something that you kind of like doing, mm-hmm. you know, do that. And then that may lead into an even more specialized part of that thing. You know, if you like drawing, maybe you like, you know, the, the tattoo, you know, I've known people have become like tattoo artists from, I, I know a guy, uh, one of my best friends from high school, he was, you know, he was a painter and became like a restaurant designer with a group of his friends and like, you know, has Michelin star restaurants now. And, you know, it's just, you never know where the passion is going to lead, but, but you do, you have to have a passion at something. So that, that's always very important. Don't ever like, you know, I know people who were like, Oh, I, I, beca- I went to pharmacy school cause it's a good job and I, I can retire when I'm 50. And it's just like, so you're just like fast forwarding the next 30 yeah. years of your life. So you can get to the point where you want to do, where you can do something you want to do. <laughs> there are people <laughs> that are a little too reckless with that thing too. You know, I know people that just, they're going, you know, all over the world. I mean, I, I will say this with comedy, too, and you might be able to attest to this. There's people who, um, especially now, like when you first start doing comedy, you have the opportunity to like, you just want to do a bunch of shows, right? And so, especially mm-hmm. now, there's people that do, it's all about the the business of it instead of the creative part. So it's like, I'm going to book four shows i'm going to be able to do two or three shows a night every night this week and i'll have 20 spots and then i can work on this and then uh when you see these people they never say hello because they're rushing they're they're late to every show they don't get to meet anybody they're doing the same act that they're doing in all the shows because they don't have time to write anything in between and so part of the process is really concentrating on the show really embracing the suck of it when it doesn't go well and like forcing yourself to like what do i need to fix and why am i not doing you know there is there's a point of overanalyzation but then there's also like just doing the comedy part it's it's like going to the gym four times a day and when you don't really need like if you if you were more productive with your workout and playing it better instead of just going blindly into like, I'm just going to do this thing until I burn out almost. So there's a mm-hmm. bunch of different approaches to that, I guess. Interesting. Yeah. yeah the, um, I know uh, at least some comics I heard from said the pandemic forced them to basically stop doing that habit of overdoing it with just going to clubs. And then they were forced to sit down and write. Did, did that happen to you at all? Well, yeah, I mean, the the whole act of it, like you do need shows to like get the audience and all that kind of stuff. And I will say I'm one of the few people who and this is this actually was another one of those aha moments was um, I ended up doing a, a bunch of like corporate Zoom stuff. And so oh, yeah. got really good at doing the Zoom like later at home so I could see everyone these were all people that had worked for home for months, you know, and they, they just, you know, and, and my whole thing was, I'm not going to do an hour show. Like it's a regular comedy club and just talk at people. I did everything from like for Apple to, I did HOA meetings for like these really rich neighbors. Like Whoopi Goldberg was on one of my Zooms, and like, oh. I made her laugh. Like it was, it was like really like, you could tell you were making a difference because all these people worked together and they hadn't seen each other in months. And so you could just tell like, hey, I see Steven over there. How's, you know, make you make fun of his lamp or his fan or something. And he got a laugh, you know, and he's dealing with all this stuff at home. And I could tell it really. And, you know, and I had people, you know, I was doing stuff in like Switzerland. You could work anywhere. I did like New Year's Eve in New Zealand. And uh, it was that thing of like, wow, I'm really reaching people with this. And I can tell I'm making a difference. Like I had a there's a guy. I think it was Switzerland, maybe he he kept asking me questions that like he he wanted to keep emailing me. He's like, I never thought about the um, like the mental aspects of of this. Like you made everyone laugh, but it did feel like it improved 
their mood. It made them more productive this week. They seem to be joking more with mm. each other. Like I never, and he, you know, it's coming on. Oh my, it almost sounds like a little German. Cause it's like, he doesn't want to like admit the, uh, the actual, like, it's like laughter is the, uh, like a thing you can put in a bottle. It's like, it's funny that you gave them this thing and then they're laughing, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. they're like, like, uh, but it was, it, but it was very, like, he looked at it very scientifically, like, wow, I never, you know, so it improved their mood and made them laugh and it kind of brought them closer together. I feel like we should do this like once a month, something like this. And it like, you know, even he, he was coming from the business side of it, it's like doing stuff like this would be better for my employees because, you know, and it wasn't like. I love comedy and we need to do more of this. It was like, we need to do some, something like this. You know, I had no idea what the, uh, you know, the positive ramifications were going to be, uh, but, but it was really good. And I was like, Oh, wow. That's, that's made me kind of think about it in that, in those terms. There's a video that's gone around the internet. I've seen a couple of times of uh, Ethan Hawke talking about creativity and art. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but he makes a point in there that uh, everybody thinks the arts are just an extra until your heart is broken and then you need poetry or music, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's interesting because I think especially during the pandemic times, uh, the the heightened of that, just uh, that what we're talking about, just like a kind of like being able to laugh. And sometimes, and this goes into that whole thing of escapism, sometimes right now today, important political commentary aside, it's like once in a while I just need to be able to laugh too, right? And and mm -hmm. that's it. There's a simplicity there. And how much do we pull away during good times and say, oh, you know, arts or whatever. They're, they're you know, it's, oh, yeah, sure, it's good in a philosophical way, but uh, do we really value it? And it's like, well, what did we go to during those times to keep our sanity? As much as we did keep our mm -hmm. sanity, we had to go to things that were going to make us remember that it's okay to be alive and in the world, right? Not to go well, super serious, but I mean that's that's what it's doing in a way. Well, yeah, I would ask you guys too, like um, especially during this kind of like internet age. Like I know people who fall asleep to my album or my specials, and I I'm flattered by that because that's what I look for when I go to sleep. I want you know Step Brothers or something that's like here's something I've seen before that's comforting, mm -hmm. that's kind of funny and a little soothing. And so I know a lot of people do that with, with TV shows or audio books or, podcasts you know, too. all the yeah. different things. Yeah. yeah podcasts. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm always flattered when someone said, Oh, I fell asleep to your special or, you know, I always, you know, I fall asleep to your voice on, on this podcast, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, I think people use that quite often. Yeah. As long as it's not while they're listening to it in the car, I, I always think it's good too. Um, I think we, but my show has that problem, not your your act. I'm sure keeps people, but uh, that's it's interesting to get into as you put it, just kind of that normal life part because everything we do on a day to day basis, the little things we do, makes up what our life is, right? And so to be part of that, that must be a great feeling to be like you're part of someone's normal to help them to to cope and to yeah to fall asleep, even as you put it, really cool. Really cool stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a it's one of those things where somebody can quote your joke. You know, I, there's a great uh, comedian, Mitch Hedberg, uh, and you know he has a lot of these. Um, he's no longer with us, but he has a lot of these jokes that uh, you know about an escalator and about yeah different certain things that uh, you know. There's there's a really famous one is about you know uh, you know he bought a donut and he got a receipt for the donut. And he's like, I don't need a receipt. I'll give you the money. You hand me the donut. And it's just this great wordplay and cadence. And it's just 100% Mitch Hedberg. And it's so hilarious. And it got to the point where they even write that joke on uh, donut receipts at different, you know, like Mr. Donut or, you know, oh, and yeah. it's like one of those things where people can't go. Like, imagine going to a donut place and you think of this comedian every time you go. And I always thought that was so special. And um, and uh, Tom Papa, uh, hopefully he doesn't mind me telling the story, but he told me he did a, you know, he would do a joke about, um, it's one of, one of his older specials about, you know, have you ever, 
Have you ever looked inside your pillow without the pillowcase? It looks like a, a Civil War bandage, you know, or something like that. And, you know, it's just kind of a line. It's not even a full joke. Yeah. And he did a show for Clint Eastwood's charity, like in Carmel or something. And uh, uh, and so he he had done the show and Clint was like walking him across this beautiful place to like go get him something to eat from the kitchen, you know. And uh, he's just kind of walking through and it's quiet and you don't really know what to say to Clint Eastwood. He's like, you know, that joke about the the Civil War bandage in your pillow. He's like, I think about that every night before I go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what an amazing thing to give yeah, to somebody yeah. that you make them laugh right before they go, go to bed. <laughs> so I think that's like, uh, I'm reaching for something like that maybe, uh, but it, it would be something silly like that, a donut or a <laughs> something. And once again, jokes. I mean, actual jokes that you can remember in that way. That, I think that's why uh, Mitch Hedberg has such staying power, even all these years after his, he's passed, right, is is because those are those are just funny, right? They're just jokes that are funny. And so uh, it's, a, it's a great thing to be doing, and it's a necessary thing, I think, uh, very much so. Uh, well, Paul, just, just so grateful to have you on today. I want to give you a, a minute to tell everybody where to find your work and what you're doing. Before that, I, I always like to ask first-time guests if they have a um, any kind of community uh, organization or nonprofit or charity or just acts of service that they recommend for people that people should think about. It, it doesn't have to be related to what we're talking about, but it certainly can be. Do you have any of those that are near and dear to you? Oh, well, uh, like I said, I, I'm a big, um, you know, my, my mom, it, it, it's so funny that all of these things seem connected, but my, you know, my mom went from, you know, elderly care to, she became an oncology nurse. And then my brother, you know, he went to college in New York, uh, at Columbia and then ended up working at Sloan Kettering, like during the summers became a cancer surgeon. And so my mom, when she, she was a smoker until she was 40, quit smoking and started running. And she's run the New York City Marathon the last 29 years in a row. And she runs it for, she runs it for Fred's team, which is like a cancer uh, charity, the uh, Fred LeBeau who started the New York City Marathon. And she raises money for Sloan Kettering. And now it's, it's, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars over all the, all the years and you know she raises a, a nice amount every year but sloan kettering i know i don't know if cancer's touched either of your lives but like if you had someone they probably ended up going to that place because it's like the place to go to so <laughs> um if anybody you know wants to donate sloan kettering or you know for fred's team even look at my mom she's got her thing uh, she, like uh, they run every November. She runs for Fred's team, you know, and doing those shows at the cancer support places, you know, anything that kind of supports the, uh, you know, people going through that. I know my parents used to drive people to treatments and, and stuff like that. I know there's always like something you can do. So it's just, you know, we talk about people going through illness and, you know, everyone, yeah, I mean, I think the hard part about illness is like, uh, even if you have a cold, you're just like, you feel like it's never going to end. Like you kind of get in that mindset of like, am I going to be sick like this forever? And obviously you talk yourself, but you know, but uh, you know, you just know when people are in the mindset of like trying to get through something, um, any, any kindness really, uh, you know, really affects them. So I, I think that's always a great thing. Uh, to give. That's a wonderful, especially someone deal with that. Yeah, a wonderful cause and important thing too. I, I like you. You know, I've had that experience as well of people in my family, and so I'd always like to add too. You know, as you mentioned, fundraisers and things, people who might be in a, a financial bind, you can always locate if you if you want to do something. You know, look up some of those fundraisers and you know uh, uh, retweet them or share them on your social media so people will see them, right? Or re-X them. Sorry, guys. I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> guys turn well, no, th- I think I think both of you guys, you know, this is always, you know, it's funny how, uh, you know, you talk and you're like, well, 
if if this isn't funnier, if th- you you want to be funny or interesting. So hopefully this was uh, more interesting than funny um, because I think you know a lot of people are, are coming to this for a little bit of you know guidance and and um, you know validity. I think some I know a lot of people when they're dealing with mental issues or you know uh, uh, a mental you know. Uh, I guess um trying to think of the word uh just when people make a decision to do something I think they always need affirmation and sometimes it comes in these little little different things and sometimes it could be just uh, one thing that we said today so um you know so I appreciate you guys doing this and I know it means a lot to people so hopefully they enjoyed this <laughs> thank you I appreciate what you do do as well um with that too, and appreciate those words a lot. That is the that is the goal uh, of what what we're trying to do. Um, tell people where they can find you, where they can track your work, where they can stalk you, whatever it is you want them to know. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, Paul has a website dot com. That's my name. Just Paul has a website dot com. Just spell it out. And uh, so the brand new album is called Ice Cream versus Everything. We recorded it at the National Comedy Center in New York, which is the bir- birthplace of Lucille Ball in Jamestown. Oh. So I filmed it on the set of the uh, Tropicana nightclub from the I Love Lucy <laughs> show. Awesome. So, um, so it was just, you know, we did it in March and, and, you know, speaking to the pandemic, you know, we were trying to record a couple of times and it just wasn't there. And, and uh, we just put together a whole weekend at the, the, at this uh, national comedy center. It was just amazing. We, the, you know the it's over an hour it's it's the whole first show we just had so much fun and we're just like we're just gonna keep this all as one piece so it's it's kind of like you know my on the road or you know Kerouac just had the same long scroll so it's like this is one of the few times where it's like an hour and you know five minutes and it was like the full show basically and everything just went like the energy anytime we try to like edit something out it just messed with the the vibrance and the energy of that mm. the room and you know i don't know if you guys have listened to you know live albums you know there's something to that mm-hmm. like i can feel what it was like to be there yeah. and so that's that's what we think uh this album is so it's uh, ice cream versus everything just came out uh uh, a week ago, it made to number three on the album charts. I was I was above Weird Al and Eddie Murphy for a minute Ooh. there, so oh. it's pretty cool. Um, wow. But yeah, you can get it on Spotify, uh, Apple Music if you have that. You can get it free most places, YouTube even. But any streams kind of go go towards me, so uh, any support would be great. And uh, sharing it and passing it along is always great too. So thank you guys. Wow, I always like to know where is the best place for people <laughs> to be able to to access it for you. I mean, where's the best place for you? So it sounds like streaming is going to be, yeah, because you're the artist. So you, come on, you know. Yeah, yeah. So Apple Music. Like, I think I have like a membership. You know, yeah. Spotify. I know some people only use Spotify, so it's on there too. Uh, but but yeah, even the YouTube stuff i know the tracks around there now because people have youtube music or something it's it's right. everywhere so right. it just depends on what you need it for so thank you guys thank you and uh london you want to mention uh, your podcast and what you're doing yeah um so i have uh my attempt to mix sort of the, the levity with the gravity of real life i have a character-based improv comedy that more or less we prank listeners with a brief authentic medical lesson so it's like, uh, I guess these days it's like 30 to 45 minutes, usually an episode. And then five minutes of that, the, the rest of it's pretty silly, but five minutes of it is me teaching you some legitimate medical topic. And that's in the title is uh, like the last one we recorded was what radial neuropathy or Saturday night palsy. So uh, it's just this thing you might get if you um, use crutches and there's pressure on your armpit. Uh, the, a wrist drop uh, might happen. So that it's that kind of thing. We get very technical briefly. I read it like ad copy and the rest is characters and silly stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah. You have yeah, someone cool. come on and be a pretend guest, right? In an improv, then you do an improv yeah. scene with them. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, awesome. Paul, you're welcome to join if you ever feel like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Does that sound like the uh, Seinfeld episode when Kramer has to, uh, pretend to be to have an illness in the medical uh 
<laughs> Wasn't it? Did you ever see that one where he was like the medical school and they had to like the medical students had to diagnose him and he's like, what do you got today? <laughs> Starts listening, yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah. Really fun idea and really fun show. Um, so just uh, to sign off one thing real quick so people know this is coming out in early September, if you're listening in the future, September 2023. But uh, the episodes coming up in this month are going to be focused on trauma therapy and Batman. So, you know, they go well together because Batman mm. is very traumatized and traumatizing, too. We'll get into, you know, anyway, there's going to be a bunch of episodes because it is Batman Day in September. Uh, hey, so hey I'll, give you, I'll give you something real real quick. This, yeah. is, this is great. So my buddy, my childhood friend, and Don Hardy, he directed that movie, Bat Kid Begins. And I don't know if you ever saw it. It's the one that's, um, it was a, a Make-A-Wish kid wanted to be Batman uh, oh, for a yeah. day. Yeah. And so they turned San Francisco into Gotham City and they got George, like all these like famous people. They even had Obama call the kid on the phone and got a real Batmobile. Awesome. And yeah. so he covered it as like a, re- a regular news story, but then he made a full length. I think it's on Netflix now, but yeah. So just so you know, those do combine yeah. more than you would think. So uh, that's amazing. So yeah. that's fun. So yeah, there'll be some of that coming out. Uh, can I watch the Instagram too. We're trying to get a uh, little series going this month where I'm going to be pulling an internship at Arkham Asylum. So everybody can check in for a few seconds of fun silliness, but also talking about diagnostic process as well. So we're going to, that's my attempt to blend. Uh, so we're all blending, right? We're all blending yeah. fun and, and seriousness. <laughs> cool. So, well, uh, Paul, thank you so much again. And uh, uh, London also, thanks for co-hosting today. Yeah. Appreciate yeah, you guys. Fun. You guys. No, thank you day. guys. Uh, yeah. Both of you. Thanks so much. Thank yeah, you too. Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.